Welcome to the first of the 10 CLE webinars for the 2021-2022 webinar season. The title for today's webinar is Nonverbal Communications, Implications for the Mediation Process. The presenter is Don Sweet, PhD. Uh, Don Sweet's research focuses on nonverbal behavior in the context of threat detection, threat, uh, uh, the uh, use of force and bias in decision making in officer citizen interactions. She was recently awarded a grant from the Federal Bureau of Investigation High Value Detainee Interrogation Group to investigate gesture production and deception. She was the recipient of the Kurt Olson Early Career Research Scholarship. She has published in journals such as Law and Human Behavior, Criminal Justice and Behavior, and the Journal of Threat Assessment and Management. Her research has been featured on NPR's All Things Considered, Iowa's Public Radio's River to River, BuzzFeed, and Salon. Uh, welcome, Dawn. How are you? I'm doing okay. Thank you very much for having me. It's really a pleasure. So why don't we start with what you're doing for the FBI? Sure thing. So I was very fortunate, uh, myself and some colleagues, to receive some funding from the FBI to reconsider the myth of nonverbal communication. So what does that mean? Um, previous research in the area of deception and nonverbal behavior has shown that nonverbal behaviors are not actually diagnostic of veracity. That is, they don't really reliably predict when somebody is being truthful or offering the fabricated account. So what we did was look at the methodologies that were being used and we realized that other folks have not looked at behaviors that are communicative. So we married communication and cognitive psychology and we're interested in whether or not under appropriate interviewing conditions, nonverbal behaviors, gestures, for example, could in fact be diagnostic of veracity. And we know that gestures are connected to the semantic properties of speech, gestures enhance memory. So when we use cognitive interviewing strategies like model statements and context reinstatement, um, we do see an enhancement of these specific gestures that do seem to indicate at least across three studies that we could use um, gestures to discriminate truthful accounts from fabricated accounts. Okay. And is this still in the research phase or are you already developing training programs? So uh, that's actually a, a very good question. It it's a, it's a three-year award um, and because of COVID, we had to get some no-cost extensions. So we're actually um, supposed to be finishing the third year, which is the training year, but we're actually starting the training and validation year. So what that means is we're going to work with different law enforcement agencies across the United States, and we're going to train them in these techniques, and then we're going to validate the training. So it's going to be a pre and post, if you will. We'll see what their baseline ability is to discriminate fabricated accounts from truthful accounts. We'll train them in our technique, and then we'll assess them afterwards. So we should be finished up hopefully sometime this year, early next year, and then of course papers will be forthcoming because that's coin in the realm in academia, right? Publish or perish. Right. So I, I know you aren't done, but give me an estimate of how long a training period this would take for someone to become proficient in what you're trying to teach. So for our purposes of the research, what we're doing is setting it up over, I, I believe we're doing two days, five hours a day. And that will give us insight into um, to what extent officers could pick up the material. Now to become truly proficient, it takes years and years of practice because what we end up seeing is what we call a training effect where over time officers will revert back to whatever techniques they were using. And that's not a criticism of law enforcement, that's human behavior, right? So you, you're learning this new skill and new skills take time. Um, you know, it, it takes time to cultivate expertise and it takes persistence. So over time, folks do tend to revert, but those who stay the course, if you will, um, end up being a bit more successful and 
and discriminating the, the lie from truth. Okay, that's great. So why don't you go now into your regular presentation? Okay, so I'm sharing my screen and we'll go into slide view. So everyone should be able to, to see this, yes? Can you? Yes, it's good. Oh, okay. All right, so today what I'm going to talk about, like Carl said, is looking at nonverbal communication um, in the context of, a media, of the mediation process. And this, the information I'm talking about today is going to be from the perspective of you, the mediator, right? It, it's more about cultivating self-awareness of what you might be doing during the mediation process rather than necessarily looking at the folks you're working with and trying to monitor their behaviors and figure out what their behaviors might mean or why they're um, producing certain types of movements. Oops, I have to move my cursor. Here we go. Okay, so today's focus, we'll talk just a little bit about nonverbal communication so we have a calibrated understanding of what I mean when I talk about nonverbal communication, nonverbal behavior. Then we'll talk a little bit about bias and self-awareness, and then we'll do some debunking of some popular cultural myths. Okay, so nonverbal communication. If you say to me, I'm interested in body language, as someone who studies behavior, that to me is um, almost a meaningless term because what is body language? That's too vague. So when we talk about nonverbal communication, we talk about very specific, visible, observable behavior. So for example, gaze behavior, eye behavior, facial expressions, body orientation, um, gesture production. Um, and then also included in that is paralinguistic features. So we don't often think about the voice as being a nonverbal communication channel, but it actually is because the voice has things like tone, tenor, pace, pitch. Um, sometimes we could identify where somebody might be based on a particular accent. So I'm originally from New Jersey. I'm originally from the East Coast. And, you know, as folks who live in New Jersey, I'm sure you've heard that you talk funny, you say things funny sometimes. So there is information to be gleaned from the voice, and it is considered part of the nonverbal communication channel. So the visible, observable behaviors. One thing that we all do with these visible, observable behaviors is make judgments. We form impressions, and a lot of this impression formation is done out of our conscious control, and we may not even be aware of which cluster of behaviors that we're paying attention to. Oftentimes, it's not just one specific behavior. Oftentimes, it's a cluster or a constellation of behaviors that we're um, paying attention to to make judgments. Now, when we think about first impressions, there's some pitfalls. So I'm sure we've all heard, you know, first impressions last forever. First impressions are important. And certainly we can make a case. First impressions are, are important, but do first impressions last forever? Well, they could certainly influence how we may move forward with a particular interaction. They do form the basis for subsequent interactions we might have with the person or persons. Um, so what do I mean by that? You as mediators have a lot of interaction, a lot of contact with folks. And sometimes it might be the case you have a difficult or challenging case. And you might have to go to a colleague and say, you know, I'm, I'm just not able to work with Mr. and Mrs. Jones anymore. I find them to be acrimonious and contentious and combative and uncooperative and any other um, negative adjective you might want to layer in. And what, what we do without perhaps realizing it is we're priming somebody to look at this interaction through that lens. 
So I'm going to table that for a second and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So, so just, you know, mull, mull over um, the significance of how we might unknowingly prime people to form impressions of others where we meet them. So what we do with these first impressions is we pay attention to things about people, these visible behaviors, and we make judgments in the blink of an eye. So here's two images. You don't have to look at either one of these images for more than maybe a second to make a decision, which dog would you like to pet? Which dog would you like to interact with? And I will tell you that the happy smiling dog is my dog. That's, that's my dog, Sadie. So what we're doing is thin slicing. We take a snippet of behavior and we make a decision immediately in the moment. If you're readers, you may be familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's popularization of the thin slicing concept. This came out of the work of Nalini Ambody. Um, and that's the, that's the acad academic side of things. And Gladwell in his book, Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking, um, he popularizes it and offers anecdotes and gives you different examples of how thin slicing influences different aspects of life. Okay, now, remember earlier when we talked about Mr. and, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Jones and how one of your colleagues said they were acrimonious and combative and adversarial and uncooperative? Well, that serial ordering of information is really important. When we hear negative things about somebody, we're inclined to make our judgments through that lens. But if we hear the positive things about somebody, we'll make our judgments through that lens, right? So Mr. and Jones are acrimonious, combative. Mr. and Jones are lovely people. They're nice. They're cooperative. So there's something called the halo effect. And the halo effect is essentially, um, we have one trait that we observe about somebody. Um, you know, Mr. Jones has a pleasant demeanor and Mr. Jones is polite. And because we think Mr. Jones is polite, that's going to shade all subsequent judgments we make about Mr. Jones. So there's these path, there's these path contingencies built into every single judgment that we make about, it, about a person. And again, it's the nonverbal behavior. Is, is Mr. Jones smiling? Is Mr. Jones leaning forward? Is he um, you know, behaving in a way that we deem appropriate for the situation? So what we end up doing then is engaging in what's called confirmation bias, where we're going to look for cues, we're going to look for signals, we're going to look for behaviors to support what we already believe to be true. So we're, we're all guilty of this bias, bias makes us human. It doesn't make us bad people, but we do need to be aware that these initial impressions are going to influence how we move forward in a particular interaction. So like I was saying just a, a minute ago, the halo effect, it's just one single trait that could determine how we're going to move forward. And so we see situations where the halo effect goes wrong. You know, I'm sure you recognize this face, Ted Bundy, right? He made a heck of a first impression. He's good looking. He was good looking. He was intelligent. He was charming. And so because of all these positive impressions, people were willing to interact with him, go off with him. And we all know how that turned out for many young women, right? So this is a really extreme case of the halo effect gone wrong. And the point of this is to be aware of what you are using to inform your judgments about persons. Okay, now let's talk a little bit of, about nonverbal communication and some cultural myths. So let's start by talking about attention and focus. You notice I have two sets of feet in the picture. That's going to become relevant in just a few minutes. So here we go. 
our bodies are a rich source of information. Our bodies are a robust communication channel. What do I mean by that? Our bodies will signal what we're paying attention to, where our focus is. There's something called the frame of dominant orientation. And what this means is we use our bodies to create a space to indicate whether or not we are willing to engage, interact with somebody, um, if we're open to interacting with somebody, if you will. We use our bodies to include people in interactions, and we use our bodies to exclude people from interactions. And what's kind of fascinating about nonverbal behavior is we produce a lot of these behaviors without consciously thinking about it. We, we just go on autopilot to a certain extent. So when we look at these images, we see this couple, this man and this woman, the woman is leaning away from the man, the man is leaning toward the woman. She's using her body to send the signal of, I'm not interested, don't approach, I'm disengaging from you. And what's he doing? He's you know, leaning toward her, making a bid for her attention. It seems like a very obvious thing to say about this image, but think about how profound that really is, right? Without saying a word, these folks are indicating that they're not interested in engaging. They're not interested in having any kind of cooperative or collaborative exchange. Now, when we look at the image of the um, landscaped image of these gentlemen, they're arranging themselves in a specific way to create a space. So if we look at these folks, they're using their bodies to say, hey, you know what? This is where the interaction is going to happen. This is where communication is going to happen. And these folks here, they're using their bodies to say, hey, this is where interaction is going to happen. Even one person could indicate what their attention, what their focus is. So why is this important to mediators? Well, when you're interacting with your, with your clients, when you're interacting with folks you're helping um, you know, resolve whatever issues they may be having, we need to be aware of what message our bodies are sending, right? So imagine a situation where perhaps you're working with a couple who you just may not like. We're human. We have preferences for, for, for people, for restaurants, for activities. And you know, sometimes we really just struggle to, to like the people we're working with. So what do we do? Out of our conscious control, non-consciously, we might orient away from the person. We might like this person over here better, so we might find ourselves orienting toward this person a little bit more. So why is that important? Well, you're excluding somebody from a conversation. That may not be your intent, but that's the message that, that your body is sending. So remember the image of the feet? One cultural myth that we have is that our feet point in the direction of what we're interested in. That's not actually true. When we look at our bodies, we have three different planes. We have our sagittal plane that divides our body in half left to right. And then we have the transverse plane that divides our body in half at the hips. And then our coronal plane that divides our body in half front and back. It's your hips that will determine where your interest is, where your attention is. Attention is very much a cognitive activity. And you know, short of running around hooking up people's skulls to EEGs, we don't really know what they're paying attention to, but the visible marker of attention is our hips. What are, what are our hips pointing at? Because where my hips go, my feet have to follow. It, this is not an ideal demonstration, but my feet are pointing toward the screen. I can move my hips this way, facing toward my dog over here sleeping. Well, do you feel like I'm paying attention to you when my body is moving this way? 
No. So we have to look at the hips. So when you're in mediation, um, one thing to look for as a sign of engagement is what are people's hips doing? Now, just because somebody might temporarily do what we call pull away from an interaction, it doesn't mean they're disengaged. It could, it could just be a postural shift. It could just be, it's more comfortable for me to you know, turn my body and sit like this. But it could also be a signal that the person might be disengaging. And it could be a signal that you're disengaging. When it comes to behavior, when it comes to looking at the body planes, it doesn't take a whole lot of movement to send a signal that you're disengaging from an interaction. So on my side of things, we talk about body torque and torque is just the twisting and the movement. If we look at our entire body for a moment and if we're in what's called neutral position, our head is straight ahead, our chin, is not tilted, our heads aren't tilted or, or turned, our chins are, are, pa are parallel, our, the, the tip of our chin is aligned with our supersternal notch, et cetera. That's neutral position we're, we're facing forward, right? So your, your, your supersternal notch is that little horseshoe shaped bone over here. I don't like touching mine, just it gives me the heebie-jeebies. So when we're you know, paying attention head on, we're completely aligned. Now, in behavior, in interaction terms, it doesn't take a whole lot to be considered out of frame. If you think about turning your head left to right, theoretically, and, and depending on how limber you are, you have 90 degrees of rotation available to you if you turn your head to the left or if you turn your head to the right. Now, certainly we've been in situations where someone might turn their head just a little and then we might feel like they're not paying attention. So I'm, I'm trying to face my camera as best I can when I'm talking to everybody. But those times when I move my head to look at my second screen, I have my slides up. So what I could see, you could see, but you probably start wondering, am I even paying attention to you because I moved my head ever so slightly? So it only takes as little as a 30 degree movement to be considered out of frame or give the impression that you're not paying attention to somebody. So if we break down the math, if we have that 90 degrees available to us, turning our head left to right, 45 degrees is going to split it at the midpoint. So something as little as that might signal I'm not paying attention. And same thing with tilting your head down. Okay, so again, why is that important? What we do non-verbally is out of our conscious control. Our feet don't signal what we're paying attention to, our hips do, and moving our heads ever so slightly left or right may um, unintentionally signal, I'm not paying attention, I'm not focused. So earlier I mentioned the other two body planes, the coronal plane front and back and, and the um, transverse place, or the, the transverse plane, it cuts us in half at the hips. And so certainly one commonly understood behavior of engagement is leaning forward. So if I lean forward, presumably you're going to interpret that as me being more attentive, more focused. Now, if I lean back in my chair, I mean, I'm not sitting now, but if I were sitting and if I were to lean back, one possible way to interpret that is I'm not paying attention, but it could also signal that maybe I'm tired of leaning forward. Maybe leaning back is um, more comfortable for me because my back is bothering me. People need to shift. There, need, there needs to be postural shifts when people are sitting for extended periods of time. So looking at how people are using their different body planes, it could give you some insight, but we don't want to go all the way to the extreme and say, oh, because... Mr. Jones leaned back, it means he's not engaged. That may not be the case. It may be the case, but it may not be the case. It's one bit of information within a longer stream of behavior. So again, some things to keep in mind. Um, when you're interacting with your clients, make sure you signal that your, your, your attention and focus is on them. 
Certainly, you, you don't want to keep doing postural shifts in a chair that's stationary, but if you happen to be in a chair that has wheels, one strategy might be to we're talking to party A, swivel your chair seat so you're talking to party A, and then swivel back to talk to party B. And if you're addressing both, move your head side to side, make people feel included, use your bodies to create a space where collaboration could happen. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about attention and focus. This time we'll talk about eyes, gaze behavior. Gaze has four functions, but today we're going to just focus on the cognitive function of gaze and the regulatory function of gaze. So let's begin by talking about one of my favorite cultural myths. If someone looks away from you, when he or she is talking to you, it does not mean that that person is lying. That is a misapplication of other research, right? So if you take nothing away from our conversation today, please leave remembering this. Because someone does not make eye contact when they're looking at you, it does not necessarily mean they're lying. For those of you who have kids, for those of you who may have been a naughty little child, think back to the conversations you, you may have had with your parents or with your children when they were younger. Look me in the eye, tell mommy, tell daddy, did you break the vase? So what does your child do? Make direct eye contact and say, no, that wasn't me, that was the dog. That was the cat who was dribbling the basketball and broke the vase. Okay, so again, Someone looking up into the left or up into the right or down or looking away, it doesn't signal deception. So when you see this on reruns of CSI and um, you know law and order, it's bad information. When we are having conversations, our cognitive load is elevated. So cognitive load is a function of what we could remember, working memory, for example. And so you, the speaker, or you, the listener, may need to process information. So what tends to happen when we look away, one possible explanation for that is I'm processing information, I'm thinking. If this were an in-person conversation, this is the point where I would ask somebody to come up and join me and I would have you face the crowd and I would look at you and I would ask you two questions. I would ask you what's called a reflexive question and a reflective question. A reflexive question is something like, what is your name? What is your date of birth? Questions that you don't need to think a whole lot about. When we're asking folks reflexive questions, they very rarely, if ever, look away from us. When we ask folks reflective questions, so for example, if I were to ask you, what did you have for breakfast on Thanksgiving morning in 2015? Well, you have to think back. So what are you going to do? You're going to look away. Does it mean you're lying because you're looking away? And then you tell me you had a bowl of oatmeal and blueberries? No, it just signals that there's some sort of cognitive processing happening. Okay. Now, why is that important? That's important because there are these hard and fast rules that govern turn taking in conversation. So when two people are having a conversation or when more than two people are having a conversation, there's something called turn taking, speaker listener roles. So the speaker in a two person conversation, even the speaker in a conversation with more people, is more likely going to look away because the speaker has more cognitive load. The speaker is doing more processing. The speaker is thinking about, well, how do I want to say this? What language do I want to use? What example would I do I want to use to, to discuss this concept? So that's normal behavior for someone to look away. The listener, the person who's taking in the information, is going to hold their gaze on the speaker because the, the listener is looking for nonverbal cues that help clarify, um, help 
uh, help them understand a bit more, help them focus, pay attention. So pay attention when you leave here, when you're having a two-person conversation, pay attention to the speaker listener. So when one of your clients is talking to you and this person is not looking at you as he or she is talking, it doesn't mean they're disengaged, disinterested. It means they're likely thinking, they're processing about something. Now, when the speaker is ready to yield the floor, so we have behaviors that are referred to as um, uh, floor maintaining behaviors, right? I'm, I'm going to look away. I'm going to talk fast. I'm not going to give you a chance to interject. But when I'm ready to yield the floor in a two-person conversation, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the person that I'm talking to, and I, and I might do an eyebrow flash, right? The, that's the signal. Okay, now it's your turn. This pattern bears out consistently. So Again, just because someone's not looking at you doesn't mean they're not necessarily paying attention. It doesn't mean that they're lying to you or fabricating information. Okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about body orientation and body planes, and we've talked about gaze, let's talk a little bit about voice. Voice is said to have two dimensions, content and relational. The content dimension of voice, this is what we're saying. These are the words that are coming out of our mouths. There's also the relational dimension of voice. This is how things are, are being said to us. So think back to when you were a child or think back to an interaction with one of your kids, if you have kids. And has anyone ever said to you or, or have you ever said, don't take that tone with me. Who do you think you're talking to? It's not so much the words, perhaps, that the person has an issue with. It's how the words are said. So, for example, I can say to Carl, hey, Carl, could you please close the door? That's neutral, right? That's just content, making a request. Hey, Carl, could you please close the door? The tone is going to signal something about the relationship something about what we might think about the person. So I make that neutral, I, I make that request in a neutral a tone. And then I say, Carl, could you close the door? That's a little bit more hostile. There's a little bit of edge, a little bit of punch there, right? So how we talk to people is something else that we need to be aware of. Sometimes we're in a hurry. Sometimes somebody asks us a question and we already answered that question, or we already gave that information, and we're busy people, time is precious, and we might very quickly um, offer a response. And we may not even be aware that our response might be perceived to have some sort of edge or emotional content in it. So when we're interacting with others, we are very much aware or we try to be aware of what we're doing with our bodies, with our gaze, with our gestures, but sometimes we forget about voice. And again, what we do non-verbally is, is oftentimes out of our conscious control. So we might need to be aware of how we're responding to somebody because words matter for sure. We all know words matter, but what also matters is how those words are said there is a way to deliver a message that could still maintain good positive relationships, even though the essence of the message might have a bit of a negative tone or, or tenor content to it. Okay. Spontaneous speech production, unrehearsed speech, when you're having a conversation off the cuff, Presumably, when you go into a mediation session, you have an agenda, you have goals, there are outcomes that you're hoping to achieve, but it's very likely the case that you are not working from a script. It's very likely the case that your clients are not working from a script. Part of spontaneous speech, a natural part of spontaneous speech, is what we call filled pauses, um, uh, er. They're placeholders. And what I mean by that is if you're speaking and you're not ready to yield the floor, 
you might use an um or an uh to signal to the listeners that you still want to maintain the floor. So another cultural myth surrounding filled pauses is that people who use them may not be very smart. And that's not the case. Filled pauses signal there might be some kind of emotional arousal going on. Someone might be nervous. Someone might be upset. Someone might be agitated. They could be feeling anxious. They're feeling overwhelmed. A kind of load is elevated and they're trying to figure out what they're going to say. So the ums and the ahs, they're not necessarily a signal that someone may not be very intelligent, that someone may not be prepared. It's a signal, again, of some sort of cognitive processing happening. It's an indication that I'd like to maintain the floor and it could signal anxiety. And all that is, is, is information. You don't need to necessarily interpret that beyond, okay, this person is signaling to me that they might be feeling something and I need to give them the space to finish their conversation. And I shouldn't assume that they're not intelligent. Uh, Dawn, let me yeah. um, interrupt to give an, sure attendance, an attendance code. So okay. the first attendance code is 1577. One five seven seven. Okay. Good. Okay. So we're coming into the home stretch. So here we go. Some strategies to, to consider. Each mediation session is different from the last one. What do I mean by that? Yes, you may have encountered clients in the past who felt similar in some way. But remember the beginning of our talk, we talked about first impressions. We talked about the effect of serial ordering of information. We talked about how we're paying attention to visible behaviors. And you know there are these heuristic models that we all abide. If I see X, I know it means Y. That may be the case, but it may also not be the case. So we have to approach each new each encounter as a new encounter, right? We, we don't want to say, oh, I've seen people like this before. It well, you know, what if this is the one couple where maybe you saw folks exhibiting these behaviors, but this is the one couple who's going to violate that, right? They're they're going to surprise you and they're not going to fall in a, in a pattern that you're expecting. So you can't go into the same river twice. We've all, we've all heard that. And I put a couple of pictures of my dog with a backdrop of a river to remind us that we can't go to the same place twice, that same river twice. Each mediation session is new. So we need to come to this with open minds, trying not to bring whatever biases with us. When we're considering behavior, um, we need to stay at the level of, of description. But what we tend to do is observe something and make a snap decision. Make a snap decision. Remember, we talked about thin slicing earlier. We need to describe the behavior that's observed, and then we have to ask ourselves: In this context, does this behavior make sense? Sure. And if you're in a mediation session, that's um, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's especially stressful because you have a, a couple who's divorcing after, you know, 10 or 12 years of marriage. They have to divide up the marital assets. They have to talk about retirement plans, 401ks, pensions, college funds for their children if they have children. Um, describe the behavior. Don't go zero to 60. Be aware that we're making snap decisions, but take that step back and ask yourself, okay, what's informing this decision? Is there the halo effect going on? Um, is it confirmation bias because I'm seeing this one behavior? Um, am I going to look for cues to support what I believe? What we're talking about in essence is person perception where we select the stimuli. There's some behavioral cue we pay attention to it. But how do we know that that is the accurate clue, the right cue, if you will, to help us to determine something about this person? We organize information, we put it into categories, we classify it. 
oh, this person's going to be difficult, this person's going to be easy to work with. But if you're starting with bad information, if you're selecting the wrong cue or a non-reliable cue to begin with, remember there's that path contingency. It's going to inform the, how you organize it, how you classify, and that in turn is going to affect how you're interpreting what you see. And then a reminder, be aware of your own biases. We all have biases. It doesn't make us bad people. We need to be aware of our biases so then we can act accordingly, so we could adjust our own behavior. And then the last slide I have, and hopefully there are some folks who are fans of parks and recreation, and you know Ron Swanson, who's just always a grumpy kind of person. Sometimes you know, people just look grumpy. It doesn't mean anything, right? So don't go overboard in trying to interpret the nonverbal behavior that you're seeing, right? Sometimes people just have resting grumpy face and sometimes a book bag that looks angry is just a book bag. And sometimes a mop that looks angry is just a mop. So stay level of description, pay attention to biases and catch yourself when you think you might be going down the path of confirmation bias or um, being influenced by the halo effect. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you. I appreciate being invited to talk with your group. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer any questions okay. you might have. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions first. But okay. if people want to raise their hands, uh, I will then call on them as soon as I ask these few questions. Okay, so, you know, you can go into any magazine, any online search and find, I can't tell you how many articles talking about what body language means. So I, I pulled up this one. It's from a, a, um, a website called betterhelp.com, which mm -hmm. is an online therapy provider. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so here are some examples of what they said. Turning, tilting your head to one side. When you are tilting your head to one side, it usually means you are listening intently and deeply interested in finding out what information you're being told. Any, any? So there's research to suggest that if you tilt your head to the left or to the right, that it's one way of interpreting that is it's an act of submission, right? You tilt your head left or tilt your head right. What are you doing? You're exposing a very sensitive part of your body. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there's probably someone out there who has done research on listening and came up with this finding, but you know, it could also just be it, it's comfortable, right? I'm, I'm going to listen. Um, you know, it takes a little bit less energy to tilt your head to the left or to the right rather than keep it facing up and forward. Um, yeah, I, I never know what to make of those articles where people offer five tips, you know, five tips for nonverbal behavior for a successful job interview. I, right. Some of it is good information, I'm sure. Some of it is probably not, like with the feet pointing toward you, um, you know, you know, right. where my hips go, my feet have to go. So I, I, I would just consider the source. And, and I, I will say, Carl, that a lot of early work in nonverbal communication did come out of the fields of counseling. So um, there, there's the, the Palo Alto group back in the 60s, people like Gregory Bateson, um, uh, that's Levick, Beaven, and Jackson. There's a researcher called Shefflin. So a lot of the, the work on nonverbal behavior did come from a counseling background. But of course, we all know as we acquire new information, um, you know, the, the science changes. The science could change when there's new information that becomes available to us. Okay, here's another one. Crossing your legs. The way you cross your legs can tell others a lot about you and how you're feeling at a given moment. If you cross them at the ankles, it may show that you're trying to hide something. So I will, so I will say again, um, 
consider the source, consider the expertise and background of folks who offer information like that. Um, we do know in the realm of deception, for example, there's never been any evidence to suggest that people crossing their legs at the knees or the ankles or tucking their legs beneath the chair indicate they're hiding or withholding information. So it could just be a comfortable way to sit, a way to remove some pressure on the lower back. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I never know what to say to those sorts of things because I'm an empiricist. I wanna see the research to support that so claim. Is the takeaway on this that probably, or maybe a, an awful lot of the things that you read in the popular literature, not literature, the pu publications, <laughs> website, or probably have no real support behind them, no empirical support? I, I would say that's probably the case. I, I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone who's published any of these popular press pieces, but I, I would suggest to folks who are interested in learning more about nonverbal communication, invest a few bucks and buy a textbook. Um, Knappen Hall has a really good textbook. There's the handbook of nonverbal, there's a couple of handbooks of nonverbal communication. I, I would read more empirically based information rather than, you know, buying these popular press types of books. Okay. So Sorry. as a mediator, we're, I'm in a mediation and I did divorce, so I got a couple. And um, I have two things I can do. I can listen really intently, or I can be trying to observe. And in talking to you when we were getting ready for this, you emphasize that you really can't do two things very well at the same time. So what should I be doing? I guess I should be listening, right? Uh, well, I, I would imagine listening might um, be more important in the case of mediation because you wanna make sure you're hearing what the person is saying and you have an accurate understanding what their position is, what their desired outcome is. Uh, we, we, we do know that it is exceedingly difficult to multitask or dual task. Um, there, there have been a, a few studies done looking at college students who use computers in classrooms and they're on Facebook or shop, shopping online that you, you can't successfully split attention. Um, so I suppose you could perhaps bring a second person into the room and have that person maybe be more of the observer as you're taking notes or have someone else take notes so you could focus on what folks are saying. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would probably want my mediator to listen to me and, and take notes so that I would feel like I'm being heard and, and my mediator is, is um, trying to accurately capture what I'm sharing. Okay, and you talked about um, bringing biases into mediation. I guess you also bring your experience from other mediations and what's gone right or what this, you know, this person's angry and what that might mean. And I, am I correct when I heard you say that really what you have to be doing as a mediator is suspending all of that all of that, all that, this is my experience in the past. This is my bias about that. All those other things, because they may not, probably don't, but you don't know whether they apply to the exact couple in front of you. Right, you know, I, I think there's tremendous value in having experience over X number of years working as a mediator or in any or in any profession, but we, I, I firmly believe that we need to approach each situation as this is a new situation. And yes, it may align with previous experiences, but it also may not. So I need to have an open mind. One, one thing we 
talk with about law enforcement is, you know, remind yourself that even though this is your fifth traffic stop of the day, this is a new traffic stop. And this person may not behave in the same way as the person from the previous traffic stop. So if we look at each new encounter as its own thing, we're being present in that moment, taking in the information, and then we can start to make connections to previous experiences. But if we go in predisposed with the particular way of thinking, you know, think about how that could affect the outcome of this. It could go in a very bad direction very quickly, or it could go in a good direction. So we just need to be open to this is a new experience. Let me take in the information, um, being mindfully aware of the here and the now. Okay. Uh, Janine Dickey has raised her hand. So Janine, uh, take yourself off mute and ask your question. Uh, Dr. Sweet, first of all, this has been very informative and thank you. Um, it's oh, really, you. really a valuable, valuable um, hour here. Um, I do all my mediation. I don't do divorce. I'm, I'm all in commercial, but it's all the same um, skills, skill set when with regard to your relation relating to the clients in front of you and attorneys. Specifically, my question is with regard to the 30% head turn, which may denote a lack of focus or a decrease of focus on behalf of the mediator. Do you have any tips for the remote environment? I mean, I have a second screen where I'm putting up documents. I've tried experimenting. So it's like sort of behind my computer, behind my camera. Um, and then specifically, I take notes uh, when I'm speaking to a client, but that involves my head turning um, a bit to my notepad. Any practical tips? So that's a really good question and it's an important question. And what I do, so last year we spent so much time in Zoom land teaching classes. Um, you know, there, there, there's the absence of social cues. So people, like you say, can't see the monitor. So what I do is say, well, I have my monitor over here. So if you see me suddenly face this direction, it means I'm looking at my screen. And I, I believe I did that earlier when I was talking about if we go that 30 degrees. So to let people know, hey, I'm paying attention, but I'm looking over here because this is where I'm taking notes. Or if you see my head go down, it's because I'm taking notes. So a, a simple statement like that could reduce the uncertainty and whatever anxiety folks might be feeling when they see their mediator suddenly looking over here or looking down. Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, we have a question from Michelle, and it is, if shoulder shrugging or smiling is happening, is that a sign of lying? Um, You're smiling. No, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, so, I, okay, so let's first talk about smiling. Um, there's two types of smiles. There's the genuine smile, where we see activation of your orbicularis oculi. So that's the sphincter muscle around your eyes. So you get the crow's, the, the, the crow's feet, and then there's activation of the zygomatic major. So when these muscle groups work together, it's a genuine smile. And then there's also the social smile um, where we just activate the lower face. The field is split depending on which camp you want to be in. There are some researchers who say that we can use affect, we can use emotion to discriminate truth from lying. And then there's another camp that says, well, no, we can't. So there's a third smile, it's called the Duchesne smile. And this smile was named after, I think it was an 18th century anatomist. It's, it's sometimes referred to as duper's delight and getting back to all the naughty children we all have, but imagine a situation where, um, you know, you come home and you find cookie crumbs on the counter and you ask your little girl or little boy, did you eat the cookies? And they say no, and then they flash this really quick smile that it's duper's delight. It's, it's the sense of, um, 
I'm smarter than you, I'm getting over on you. And this was noticed in a, a, a newsreel um, with a guy named Kim Philby back in the 40s. He was, I think he was a British intelligence officer and he was, it, it, he was alleged to have been involved with the disappearance or murder of someone. And when he was being asked about this, it was that Duchesne smile. Um, and then there was another famous example, Diane Downs. She was interviewed on 2020 back in the 80s, I think. Um, she's one of, she was a fame, she was famous because she killed her kids when she was talking about this event. Um, you know, she had that Duchesne smile. So I, I would say be cautious, um, don't over interpret. And then, you know, a, a shoulder shrug, you know, what does any shrug indicate? Uncertainty, indifference, I don't know. Uh, so uh, yes, they could indicate deception, but they could also not indicate deception. And I know that's not the answer you were looking for, but that's, that's the answer I have. Okay, let me read the second uh, attendance code which is 2162, 2162. And another question from uh, Jerry Scola. So Jerry, take yourself off mute and ask your question. Jerry? Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Dr. Sweet. Uh... Have, have you done any research on uh, body language and uh, right brain, left brain, or uh, a visual or, or uh, a hearing uh, individuals? So again, that's another good question. I personally don't do research in that area, but I recall seeing a few studies here and there where people were looking at handedness, left-handedness, right-handedness um, in deception detection. And I'm, I'm sure there are folks, Jerry, out there who are doing that. I'm just not aware of anybody, but if that's a specific interest of yours, I'm, I'm happy to see if I can find anything and then I can share it with Carl and Carl could hopefully pass it on. Um, John, we had a question, which is, are you going to be sharing your slides? Will you do that? Yeah, sure. If, if you all like to see the slides, I'm happy to send them okay. on to Carl. Um, and I could include pictures of my dog or not, yeah. whatever you prefer. Okay, that's great. We only have a few minutes. A uh, long time ago, we had someone talk to the association. And one of the things he talked about was micro expressions. And he said, you know, these are uh, universal across all people, all countries, et cetera, and they would tell you certain things. Could, so could you talk about micro expressions for a few minutes? Sure, so uh, Paul Ekman wa was um, responsible for introducing micro expressions into the scientific community. And back in the 60s, Paul went to Papua New Guinea to look at the expression of emotion. And at that time, what he found was when a fella in Papua New Guinea was happy, it looked the same on the face as when someone in New York City was happy. Our face has, I, I believe it's 42 or 43 facial muscles that move vertically and horizontally. And there's a set of seven basic emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, contempt, surprise, and, um, and, and anger that have a distinct physiological footprint. So the facial action coding system, right? It could tell you which muscles are being activated in a particular emotional expression. Like I said earlier, as new information becomes available, scientific information is updated. Um, so information about science will change over time. It doesn't mean it's fake or false. There is current thinking um, and there's been some pushback on the idea that um, emotions are universal. Um, they're expressed in the same way. We know now that culture 
has some effect on how emotions are expressed. So the, the field of emotion um, in the context of emotion expression on the face um, it is starting to split into two different camps. People who think it is universal, people who argue from a cultural perspective. And here, here's an example. There's something called display rules. When um, we're in a particular situation, we need to make sure that our emotional reaction matches the demands of the situation. You have um, a birthday gift or a Hanukkah gift or a Christmas gift that you don't like. What do we do? We smile and say, oh, I love this pink sweater with the polka dots on it. Thank you so much. It, I mean, that's what those are the demands of the situation. So uh, culture comes into play and, and not just culture at the macro level, Eastern culture, Western culture, but it, even just norms. Um, and, you know, we. we what we do is out of our conscious control so much with emotions. So we have something called the continuum of automaticity, where on one end, we have responses that are out of our conscious control, and they just happen So the micro expressions, for example, then we have controlled responses where we um, uh, act with intent, right, it, it takes, it takes energy effort, to act happy when you're not. And then there's that midpoint goal-directed automaticity where um, you know, someone gives me an awful gift and I have a look of disgust on my face, I become aware of it, and then I smile to try to cover up that look of disgust. Um, and now I've totally lost track of the question, because, so I'm sorry, did, did, did that answer? Well, the question was just talk about it generally. Which, oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, just follow up is, is this something that someone untrained, other than having heard a speech, a presentation about a consal say, oh, I see micro expressions that are going to be meaningful? No, no. So the, the facial action coding system, it's a tone. It's, it, it's thick and it requires intense study. You have to know the muscles on the face. There's issues of onset, offset, intensity. Um, you know, if, if you're interested in reading about microexpressions, Paul Ekman has published a few books over the years, and I would just direct you to his website. Gosh, I, I hope Malcolm Gladwell and Paul Ekman give me some sort of kickback for talking about them. <laughs> well, we have reached the end of our time. Dawn, I want to thank you very much. This is great. Uh, it's really a good topic and I think helpful to, uh, to all of us. So thank you very much. And to everyone else, before you leave, we have a webinar on each of the following Mondays this, uh, this month. Uh, we have the one with cryptocurrencies next Monday. The one after that is Tech Time with Lawrence and Carl. And on the last Monday of the month, we are having a mock divorce mediation and um, there'll be more coming. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, it was really a great program today. Thanks. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.